Welcome. So today we have uh, what is going to kick off a monthly webinar for us here at Noteworthy. We're really excited to bring you guys some, some new content. And uh, today our good friend Kevin Shortell is going to be breaking down something about this particular, you know, America Cares Plan Act where, you know, people are going to be uh, helped with their homes. So uh, let me just bring him on here. I assume Kevin S is Kevin Shortell, but ah, uh, and yes, it is. Very good. What's up, Kev? Hey, how's it going? All right. Um, let me see. I'm trying to find Aaron here, but I don't see him. So uh, I was just giving a quick breakdown of what we're going to be talking about today. So okay. um, I'm going to let you uh, jump right into it here real quick. Uh, first and foremost, I do want to remind you guys that we do have an upcoming uh, event, and that is the Inner Circle event coming up in Orlando. Stay till the end because we're going to give you a special promo code that you can use. You know what? Actually, I'm just going to give it to you now. Write it down. <laughs> it's SPONSOR1, all capitals, S-P-O-N-S-O-R-1. That'll get you half off. I've got five of those. One of our sponsors was generous enough to you know, help give us some discounted tickets. There's only going to be 30 people at this event in total. So make sure that you get a ticket if you want to be there. It's going to be Orlando. We'll provide social distancing. It's, I'm pretty sure it's in a, a very decent sized room. So we'll have plenty of space. So if you're concerned about COVID, you know, come mask up, distance, whatever you feel like you got to do. But it's going to be an awesome event. Kevin's really going to, you know, dive deep into the no business. And so whether you're brand new or somebody that's looking to go next level, you know, you've been doing rentals or fix and flips and you're like, hey, I, I'm, I'm missing out on the note game here. This is going to be a great opportunity for you to come and really learn how it's done, especially with some of the unique opportunities that Kevin's actually going to be discussing with you today. So, uh, Kev, I am going to allow you to take over the screen. Awesome. It is all yours, brother. Very good. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being on. I do appreciate it. And I'm really, really excited about uh, the topic for today because it's something that has literally changed the note business the last time it came around. And I'm talking people buying notes for eight to ten thousand dollars and getting twenty, thirty thousand dollars back from the government by helping people stay in their homes. And uh, um, Ben was probably outlining a little bit of that for you of the coming wave and what's going to happen. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the COVID where people weren't paying rent, weren't paying mortgages, and the coming problem that's coming down the road here for forbearances. So the way I'm going to frame this for you today so you can follow through this very logically is let's talk about the forbearance data first of all, because I want in your mind to establish that this is absolutely a wave that is coming and you have to be best prepared for that. If you don't know that the opportunity is coming, it's very easy to put off preparation. I've been watching then this particular plan, which I'll talk about secondly, which is a new government program that's already been funded. They just haven't figured out how to spend the money yet. And I've been researching and looking at this for months now in anticipation of that. And that's how important this can be for you. And the last time something like this happened, I've got dozens of case studies to show you how people really made a huge profit, but at the same time, help people stay in their homes. And that's very important because the government realized they couldn't do it the last time that we had the market crash, that Wall Street tried to come in and fix it. They couldn't do it. And eventually, it came down to the entrepreneurs. It came down to people like you and I that we could correct this situation because we would take the time uh, to work with people on an individual basis. And these programs really did accelerate it. But as you'll see, and what's going to happen this time is what happens with a lot of these good government programs is the very people who need those programs don't know about them. They don't know about them. Why? They don't advertise them. Some of these programs look too good to be true for people, and they think it's some kind of a scam. So part of our job is going to be enlightening people, educating them, pushing in them in the right direction to make that phone call to get qualified for these funds that are going to be available, by the way, in every state in the United States. They've already uh, distributed the money. How do we get them to the money and help them? 
And as you're going to see is that government money is not going to go to the borrower. It's going to be paid to the note holder on the borrower's behalf. All right. So let me jump in here and get started with this for you. So for those who don't know, when the whole COVID situation happened, they issued a moratorium through the CDC saying that people, uh, if they, uh, they're affected by COVID, they don't have to pay their rent. And then the federal government jumped in and said, any loan that is backed by the federal government, we're going to give you a forbearance. And what a forbearance means is they are going to allow people to stay in the home without paying. In addition, they're going to report it on their credit report that it is being paid, even though it's not. And that was an important move, too. But eventually that money has to be paid back. So there's some uncertainty here as to how many people are actually going to be able to pay that money back and what time frame, which are they going to do that? Because there were several different forbearance plans that were laid out. So let me give you the latest data. This is all backed up, by the way, from Black Knight Financial Services, and you can uh, look it up. You can reference it if you would like to, but I'm going to break it down uh, for you very simply here. Okay. What you're looking at here is the national delinquency rate of first lien mortgages. Look in particular at the line in blue. That's the delinquency rate. You can see on the left-hand side, the percentages. On the bottom, you'll see the years. The last crash was this roll-up that started in the early to mid-2000s where people got loans that really didn't deserve the loans, right? The no income, no doc loans, those sorts of things. You all remember those days. I'm not going to belabor that. You can see eventually when that crashed, the delinquency rate in the United States went to its highest ever at 10%. It was massive, massive amount. And that's again, what the government tried to fix. That's what Wall Street tried to fix. And eventually what did happen was the Dodd-Frank Act said, well, why don't you bundle these loans up and sell them rather than foreclosing upon people? And those are the notes that built up our inventory. And that's really what took the note business from a niche in the real estate business to uh, really the, the pinnacle of the real estate investment business. And that Dodd-Frank Act is still in place and it is not going to change. The banks rather prefer that system, by the way. They don't have to foreclose. They bundle up the notes and they sell them on a regular basis in the tunes of billions and billions of dollars per year. So it peaked at 10%. You can see that it gradually went back down to more normal rates until, right? Right around that 2020 mark in, in March, you can see the big spike. And all of a sudden, the delinquency rates were up to uh, almost 8%. Why? Because of COVID and now people not working and, and some people trying to work at home, people losing their jobs, restaurants closing, you all know the story. So then this program comes in that says you don't have to pay those mortgage, but they're still delinquent, right? It's just we're kicking the can down the road. The initial forbearance programs were set up for three months, then extended to six, then six went to 12, and then 12 went to 18. At some point in time, this has to end. And that ending is coming very, very rapidly, as I'll illustrate in these numbers for you. <clears throat> okay. On this pie chart here, 7.3 million people in forbearance. You can see it on the upper left there. What have the results been since this program was implemented? Now, you'll see that this is the status of July 13th. That is the latest data that is available. So you're looking at it. Impressively, 47%, 3.46 million people, their plan has expired or they removed themselves from the plan and they are performing again. So almost half are performing again, which really means this program was successful in its intent to get that kind of a success rate. So I was impressed by that. But you also see a number over here where it says removed or expired or delinquent over here. And that's 5%. Those people, though, are in active loss mitigation. And what that means is, is that the banks are willing to work with those people. A big contrast between what we saw in the crash of the 2008, 9, and 10 versus now is back in 8, 9, and 10, people didn't have equity. We had a collapse of real estate prices. In some states, mine included here in Florida, our property values were cut in half. People had $200,000 homes and $200,000 mortgages, and all of a sudden their house was worth $100,000. 
it's very difficult, if not impossible, hence the crash, for a bank to work with somebody like that. They would take enormous losses on that. So in this case, people do have equity. If someone wasn't able to make their payment for a year or chose to get a forbearance plan, and now they're trying to work with the bank to lower the interest rate, lower the payment, stretch out the loan, a lot of different things that they can do, the banks are willing to work with them because there's equity in the property. That makes a difference, but still only 5%. That number has grown a little bit, hence the arrow that I've added to that. That's grown since the last report. Removed, expired, and delinquent has also grown since the last report. And those are the people whose plan expired or the, they were removed from the program and they are behind on payments. 3%, relatively small percentage that we know of right now. But it's also because of the way that they structured these plans. They all didn't expire at one time. They expired over a period of several months. And in fact, there was supposed to be a large amount of people expiring in August, and that even got pushed back to September. I'll illustrate that shortly for you. 19% of the people out of the, uh, out of the 7.3 million have paid off their loans. More than likely, by selling their house. Property values have gone up. They sell their house and then they move on with their life. There are still 200,000 people, 3% in active forbearance plans, meaning they're still not paying. Their plan has not expired yet. It will by the end of this year. And then we have active forbearance term extended, which is another 23%. So again, there's this premise of keep kicking the can down the road as far as we can but it has to end someday. It simply does. And that is rapidly approaching. So here are the latest numbers of these plans expiring. August, which I might have, no, okay. I, uh, it should have been, there was a lot more in August. By August, we were supposed to see, the end of August, we were supposed to see about, oh, what was it? Uh, one point something million people's plans expire but you can see they pushed it back. So in, uh, let's see, in the sixth month there, just a small, you know, uh, 30,000 plans expired. You look at the next month, July here, you had 300,000 plans expire. You got 400,000 in August and September, you're going to see then almost 700,000 plans. So when you add those all up, you're looking at about 1.4 million people. And then you can see how the rest of the plans start to expire. Because they've kicked the can down the road, nobody really knows what the reaction is going to be. In other words, how many people who are in these plans are going to say, hey, no problem. We're back to work. We're going to start making these payments again. No, no problem. The bank has moved the payments to the end of the loan and, and everything goes on perfectly. There always is going to be a percentage, though, that that's not the case. And those are the people that are going to need help. The last estimates is about 1.2 million people are going to need help with their loans. And unfortunately, the banks, because of this whole Dodd-Frank issue back in 2008, their loss mitigation departments have shrunk to nothing. They don't have the people, they don't have the time, they don't have the patience to work with all these delinquent borrowers, approximately 1.2, we'll see as the numbers roll out, who need the help. And what's going to happen to them? Their loans are going to go towards foreclosure. Uh, the loans are going to be packaged and sold. And hopefully someone like you works with these people to help them stay in their homes. The severe delinquencies, which is considered 90 days. Okay. When somebody gets to 90 days delinquent, three months delinquent, statistically, the odds of them being able to recover and catch up starts to really fall off very, very rapidly. 30 days, they can catch up. 60 days, still a good chance they can catch up. When it gets to 90 days, that's when the slippery slope starts. And you can see of the severity of the delinquencies at this point in time, the highest number of them are seriously delinquent. And that becomes the problem. That's this dark blue line here. Okay, you can see where that really ramped up and that's the highest total of people. And you can see that estimate there is over one and a half million people. That is likely to be our inventory that's injected into the inventory that we already have. That is a big problem and we are the solution. And when you can provide solutions to a problem in real estate, in real estate notes, 
that's where your money is made. So we have an opportunity here to work with these folks. And if this government program that I'm leading up to can play a role in that, which I believe it will, it's going to be one of the best times ever in the note business. So if you've been thinking about getting in the business, been thinking about a training, been thinking about coming in CSN September, you better think really hard about why you're not doing that because this opportunity is going to be here. Eventually, the solution will take care of the problem. And how much of that uh, uh, turns into financial gain for you depends upon how active you are, how well-versed you are in this industry, and how you can communicate this uh, lesson best to the people that you'll be working with. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but just to show you some of the market changes here, you've got the lowest change of series delinquent loans. That's what the SDQ is. On the right, you've got the largest change on the left. So Las Vegas is an interesting story. Las Vegas has very highs and very, very lows, but you can see their series delinquent rate has gone up the highest of any major market in the United States, followed up by Miami, New Orleans, how do you think that problem is going to uh, be uh, bigger or smaller based upon uh, the weather that just went through there and the disasters that, that that's leaving behind? Those people are going to need to have help. The businesses, the banks are not going to be able to do it. It's going to take entrepreneurs like you and I. Houston, San Antonio, so Texas markets uh, this time around, not... Um, not immune to what's going on. Uh, Orlando, Florida, in the area that I, that I live, Atlanta, uh, and you could read the rest there, the East Coast, uh, DC um, area. And then the markets that are doing better as far as series delinquent, you can see are in the Midwest, some of those, which is rather interesting because in the last probably eight to 10 years, the bulk of our market has been Midwest, Southeast right? That, that's where the majority of these assets were. Detroit has made a heck of a comeback from that. Milwaukee, heck of a comeback. And then you've got some, uh, all the rest except for Boston and Pennsylvania are out towards the West Coast. <clears throat> Why is that significant? Because you want to be able to base your business around where the greatest opportunities are. That's the most amount of people that you can help. But if you can study that market and learn the programs that are available to people in that marketplace, it makes sense to do that. You're providing a solution to a known problem here. A lot of information on this chart. Again, I'm not going to read all of this to you. I know it's a lot to look at, but I just want to show you, I do study this data. I do look at this data. I've been doing this now for uh, for 12 to 15 years, You know, studying the marketplace and, and doing state of the industry addresses at noteworthy events, uh, industry events, and things like that. All I want to point out here is this. I made a statement that said banks are getting away from foreclosures. They have been for quite some time. And instead, they are selling the delinquent notes. That's a market shift. That's, again, why the note business went from a niche to the pinnacle of real estate. If you look on this chart under the FC column here, you can see the number of properties that uh, in, this is all based on January 31st and every year here since 2005. So if you look at January 2009, 1.3 million, 2 million, 2 million, 2 million, et cetera, and you start to see this drastic fall here of uh, properties that were in the foreclosure process. Now, it really was accelerated faster than this chart would indicate, but this chart studies, was it under foreclosure? We bought a lot of notes that were under foreclosure. So the numbers don't really show you how many were foreclosed upon. It just shows you that we're in the process of foreclosure. So Dodd-Frank Act happened around here 2009 and 10, and a lot of those were shifted to selling notes. But when you look at the total of foreclosure starts, that's this middle column here, look how those numbers have changed over time. When you go to the beginning of 2021, and now they go month to month over here on the left in 2021, in January, 5,876 um, foreclosure starts in the entire United States. Less than 6,000 in the entire United States. 3,800, 4,900, 36, 37, and 4,400 throughout the entire United States. Clearly, the market, the opportunity is not buying foreclosures. It's going to be buying the notes. 
the notes that are delinquent, 30, 60, 90 days, or the notes that are past that and already in the foreclosure process. Those are going to be broken notes. The more skilled you are at fixing those broken notes, the greater your profit margin, the lower your risk is going to be. Add on top of that a catalyst, an accelerator in the form of government funds, and you've got yourself one of the best opportunities in the note industry that we've seen since the last crash, for sure. State by state, again, I'm not going to go through all of that. You get the idea of where we are. Let's talk about this plan. There was an act passed called the American Rescue Plan Act, and there's many parts of that act. I want to focus on one of those, which is the Homeowner Assistant Funds. Write that down, HAF, Homeowner Assistance Funds. They've allocated $9 billion throughout the United States. Every state is getting money. The money amounts vary by state and the severity of of their uh, problems. So out of the 9 billion, the state gets this much, the state gets this much, et cetera. But every state this time is getting money. Now already just seeing that number, I compare it back to the last time this happened, it was called hardest hit fund. It was HHF. This one's HAF. Looks remarkably similar because the last time this happened, they allocated $8 billion, but it only went to 18 states. We have a smaller problem, as indicated by that first chart I showed you, where it was 10% of all foreclosure or of all uh, loans were delinquent. Now we're looking at about 5% of all loans delinquent. They have more money, but it's spread across all of the states. Okay, as a part of that program, it assists borrowers with past due payments. Very important. So when people are not making payments, those numbers are accounted for. And that goes into a separate accounting, if you will, that uh, has to be paid back. If that property were to go into foreclosure, that so-called arrearage account, all those past due payments have to be paid back if you want to prevent the foreclosure. Okay, So if you haven't made a payment, like some of the people that you just look at, the millions of people on those stats I just showed you, one and a half million people, 90 days delinquent, haven't made a mortgage payment in 18 months, times $800 a month times $500 a month, times $1,000 a month, whatever their mortgage payment is, that builds up this arrearage account. To prevent a foreclosure, they would need to pay that. What's the obvious problem? How do they come up with that money? What if somebody uh, owes $20,000? Uh, well, let's just use $1,000 a month. They owe $18,000 in an arrearage account and they haven't been working the whole time. How are they going to come up with the money? That's the problem. So they either need to work with an investor like you, like myself, and do a loan modification to help them with that problem. But another solution would be, well, come up with the 18,000 bucks and you're good to go. Just then continue to make your regular payments. Well, how do they come up with uh, that, that money? All right. This government program, and let's see... Uh, Homeowner Assistant Funds. I've got a couple of websites I want to show you here uh, real quick. So I'm going to shift over here. And hopefully that opens up for me. Give me just a second here. This program, HAF program, is run through the Treasury Department. The last program called Hardest Hit Funds was run through the Treasury Department. It's remarkably similar. Okay. So here's the website. I'm sure I'll be able to share that with you. Um, I'll, I'll put the link on, on chat or something uh, later. So don't, don't worry about that. Here it is. Right from the Treasury Department, Homeowner Assistant Plan, $9.961 billion, So really almost $10 billion uh, for the states. But that also included U.S. territories and, and such. Uh, so how does it work? You know, and you can read through through this and it's, again, just very, very similar to the hardest hit fund program. How do we prevent mortgage delinquencies, defaults and foreclosures? 
That's what this whole thing is set up. In addition, it also can help with loss of utilities, utility bills, those sorts of things, assistance with pay payments, uh, with mortgage payments. So they might just say, look, this person can no longer afford $1,000 a month right now. So they're going to pay $600 a month and the government's going to pay $400 a month. You're still getting your $1,000 per month. There could be subsidies such as that. So each state is getting a, min a minimum of $50 million. And let's see, allocation list, notice of funds. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so I went through these program resources here. And for example, the Homeowner Assistant Fund template. This resource center is not for you and I. This resource center is for the states. So this is federal money coming from the treasury, going to the individual states, and then the states will have an entity that allocates these funds. They have a lot of say over what happens with those funds to best serve their constituents. That's the goal at least, okay? So they have to create templates and such. And they show them right here what the template should look like. Here's how you advertise what the, what the plan does. Here's all of your options, mortgage assistance, reinstatement of, of mortgages, principal reduction plans, uh, interest rate reduction plans, utilities, insurance, down payments, delinquent property taxes. So they've taken the best of the previous program, hardest hit funds, changed the name to homeowner assistance funds, HAF, and added all the good ingredients right back in here and took out some of the sloppiness. And it was very sloppy back then. Uh, they took out that sloppiness and made it a much better program here. So they're telling the states, here's what you can do. Here's the various ways that you can allocate this. So they have a parameter. The federal government has a parameter for the states that they can operate in, but each state does have the ability to move within that particular context here. First mortgages, second mortgages, loans secured by manufactured housing. I know a lot of you have notes for that. Contract for deeds and or land contracts. Hello. They didn't have that last time in the hardest hit. Well, it did for a while and then they stopped it. Um, so you're going to make sure that you're doing land contracts the right way. You're going to make sure that it's an arm's length transaction. So really excited about, about seeing that right in the description uh, for that. Um, gosh, everybody that can qualify, here's how it works. Uh, so this is really good guidance for the states, all the various programs, what their goals are. They have to get this information back to the federal government. That's the phase that we're in right now. The state money has already been allocated. What they're waiting on is for the states to come back and say, what do you plan to do with your money? What's your budget? How much money are you putting in each one of these particular areas? That's what the states have to do to get back to the federal government so that they can get this thing approved. All right, so that's that one. Let me show you the, uh, go back here. Here's the uh, purpose of the funds. I've read through all of this. You can take a look if you would like to. Who's eligible? The eligibility is gonna be pretty much everybody who falls into uh, the, the average note prices that we're already looking at. The sub $150,000 homes, everybody's gonna qualify for, you know. Uh, you're not going to find people making $200,000 a year living in, in, in homes like that, right? So they do exclude people who have higher income, those sorts of things. But this is right in our breadbasket as it was with the last plan. So that's not going to be a problem. Uh, here's the template. And I looked at this template and I immediately recognized this tip template of how they're going to outline this on their websites, because it's exactly the same thing that the treasury has for hardest hit funds. Exactly. So they've taken, again, the best of that program and put it into this particular program. And I'm telling you, once this gets set, I'm the only one teaching people about this right now. There's no other trainer, no other organization teaching about this. I, I know that I've been asking around. Nobody knows about this, this plan. And I've been waiting. 
I've been watching. If you go back and listen to some of my podcasts, if you go back and, and listen to some of my tip of the day, I've been talking about it. So keep your eye on this, everybody. Keep your eye on this because I think they're going to reinstate this part as hit fund program. In fact, for people who are my personal clients in their educational courses, one of my videos, video number 15, talks about hardest hit fund. And I've had a couple of people say, hey, you know what? Um, you, that program, you know, I, I listened to some other stuff and you said that program's expired. Just want to let you know that the videos are still there. I said, you know what? I'm keeping them there for now because I think they're either going to reinstate that program or they're going to change the name and reinstate it. So I'm going to leave it up there because I bet it's going to work remarkably similar and that's exactly what this is, is looking like. So I've gone through all of these. I also went, because I do, I do live here in Florida, so naturally I said, oh, I wonder how, how Florida's doing on this, because last time around, Florida just did a horrible job. We were given $2 billion to help people, and uh, you had five years to distribute that money. In the third year, they had only distributed maybe uh, a fourth of that money. It was absolutely ridiculous. They did a horrible job. They didn't even have a phone number for people to call. They would have to go on uh, and find a website. Well, some of the people who need this help don't have computers, don't have access to that, and they never advertised the program. So how are they supposed to find out about it? So here's Florida, and you can look up your state as well. I'm using this for an example. And again, it just reiterates here, this is what the state site's going to look like per the guidelines that we just looked at from the federal government. They're explaining what the program does. So Florida right now has $676 million allocated to it. That can help a lot of people. That money pays for that arrearage account and possibly mortgage payments going forward, but to the note holder, not to the borrower saying, hey, don't forget, you got to pass this along to the note holder comes directly to us. Who's eligible? One to four unit residents who've had hardship. Well, everybody's had that, right? Here's the act. Uh, homeowner assistance. There's a flyer. This is how you reach your people. They're giving you the marketing piece right here. When you first reach out, when you buy that note, what happens? Your servicing company has to send a letter. Guess what's going to be in the letter? This. Add this letter in there. This is a program that can help you. And they can contact these people directly for all of these things. Call them up. You're the beneficiary of this. So you're directing them to this program. They put on webinar presentations and, and slides and such. So the only thing that's missing right now is how does it work in Florida? So once Florida gets that decided, because you can see right now, all they're saying is notify me to get more information. And by the way, I'm going through every state and I'm going to get notified because I want to know every state that comes online. I'm going to track it. I'm going to show the allocation. I'm going to build a spreadsheet of who's doing what. All of my clients will have that information at their very fingertips. So in case there's some confusion on that, let me slow it down a little bit and show you what the hardest hit funds looked like in a very, very simple case study. And I've got dozens of these. Remember, this new program, Homeowner Assistant Program, is going to work the same way the Hardest Hit Fund did, different administration, different name. So we get credit for it, whatever. I don't care. How does it work? It works just like the last one. So here's a very simple example I can show you. And these are all real deals, of course. Fort Wayne, Indiana, right? That, that very common, Indiana, Ohio, all Michigan, all those states and, and buying notes. This property's worth about 40,000 bucks. Nice looking property here. I'm trying to think of the gentleman's name who, who bought this, doesn't matter. Uh, oh, Larry, yeah, it was uh, Larry. So Larry buys the note backed by this property that's worth about $40,000. Three bedroom, two bath, 1,100 square foot home. For those who are listening in from California and New York, <laughs> all those other places, look, I get it. This home transplanted in your area, a lot more money. That's why we target certain areas. That's why we go to where the market is. We don't try to force a market where there isn't. We think like bankers. Let's go to where the market is. Income levels, everything else, they're going to qualify, they're going to qualify, they're going to qualify. Okay. So what happens on this one, it's worth about 40,000 bucks. And 
Uh, let's see, I can't see what's on that slide right there. It's too high on the top. Let me just move this for a second. What does that say on the top there? Let me scroll up. Okay, property value 40,000, got it. Note price. So Larry bought this in the last downturn here. Again, I'm showing you hardest hit funds. He bought this for $8,500. Non-performing notes are sold at a deeper discount. Why? They're broken, right? You don't pay retail prices. You don't pay performing note prices. You don't pay sub-performing note prices. You pay non-performing note prices. These notes might, they haven't made a payment in a year, year and a half. Are we facing the same thing coming up? Yes, we are. I just laid that entire picture out for you. We are. So, we buy these notes based upon the value of the property, our investment to value ratio. And I've got my, my clients have a whole chart here that gives them a price guideline of about where that note should sell. So Larry buys this for $8,555. It's backed by a house worth about 40 to 45. He sends a door knocker out there. And the door knocker came back and said, you know, the wife is very combative. She wasn't willing to do this. She wasn't doing, willing to do that. And it's unfortunate, but it does happen. When people fall delinquent on these loans, they think about it 24-7. It causes stress. It causes marriages to break up. It causes all sorts of family problems and everything else. And a lot of times, you know, they blame the lender. Well, you're not the lender. You didn't give the loan here, but you do own it now. And they look at you as the lender. And uh, as a result, you know, this situation uh, is, is not, uh, it's not the most common, but it does, it does happen. Larry was trying to reach out with a door knocker because they were ignoring the phone calls, ignoring the letters. So he paid 75 bucks for somebody to go out there, the services that do this throughout the United States to hand deliver. This is a program that will help you. So part of what we're going to need to do is to really reach out to these people. And that's why I'm saying when you buy that note, put it in the transfer letter from the very get-go. Let them know that there's government programs that can help. People are much more receptive to that because of, well, let's face it, how many new government programs have been printing money lately? Okay, It's all over the news. So I doubt that you'll have situations like this. You'll have people looking for programs. So because of that, they then send a demand letter to, uh, uh, to them with from their attorney. Okay, always send demand letters with attorney letterhead as a stronger impact. That got their attention because they didn't want to lose their house. But the worst thing a borrower can do is not talk with a lender. So they're trying to reach out, trying to reach out. Finally, it even got to a point where there's a settlement conference. Now in Indiana, they try to mediate between the borrower and the lender, and they have a mediator there saying, "Well, let's let's work on this. Can you do a loan mod? Can you what payments can you afford?" And they try to work something out so it doesn't have to go to foreclosure. At that settlement conference, the attorney said, "Look, there is a government program that can help you. They will catch you up on your loan. They will make payments for you." please do this. The mediator said, yes, agreed, apply for this program. Now, again, she could have done that. They could have done that, husband and wife. They could have done that months and months ago, but didn't know about the program, were skeptical, had a hard time trying to communicate with the lender. So part of this, again, is going to be enlightening and educating these folks. Once that happened, it's all about four months as far as the time frame for when they sent the door knocker to get to the settlement conference. Could have been done a lot easier. The next thing you do is you get a loan reinstatement report. You can see this one's at Madison. A lot of you are familiar with Madison, but Allied would do the same thing. FCI would do the same thing. Whatever servicing company that you're doing will do a loan uh, reinstatement report. And that essentially gives the whole breakdown as to what is the balance due to catch this loan up. And you can see here, I've got it circled for you. The answer on this one was $25,054.39. Okay, so they apply for the program. 90 days later, takes about 90 days. I would expect with this new program, it's going to be the same thing. 90 days later, the whole thing is settled. So Larry's paid $8,500 for the loan. That was in the beginning. He also had $2,000 in legal costs, which could have been avoided if they were cooperative, but they didn't. So he's all in, his investment all in at $10,555. He gets a check from the government for $23,640, lump sum. Doesn't matter what he paid for the loan. 
It doesn't matter. It's what do they have to pay to reinstate the loan? Now, that number might be slightly different than what you saw on, on the report here, and that's because that number does change on a regular basis. So the government decided here, we're going to give you $23,640 of that, basically said, we'll give you that if you accept the deal. Okay, we're owed 25, they're going to give you 23.6. I don't think you're going to have a problem taking the 23.6, but it doesn't end there. He also gets another $389, that's their monthly payment. He gets that every month from the government directed into his business checking account for the next 15 months. So they caught her up, caught the husband and wife, I should say, they caught them up, paid the next 15 months of payments on their behalf, all directly to Larry, the investor, plus he still owns the note. So after the 15 months, they then are responsible to start making that payment again. That's why I'm telling you this is a game changer. This is an absolute game changer for your business but you got to get trained up. You got to know where to look. You got to start doing some research here. My, my clients are well ahead on this. Uh, the people who, who, who subscribe to the noteworthy newsletter, uh, I've made aware in articles about this, this program coming. So we're the only ones out there. I'm the only one out there teaching this, but that is the program. And we are perhaps a month away from all of this starting to happen. We're just waiting on the state at this point in time. All right, Ben. Aaron, what do you think? Dude, your use of data is uh, always blows my hair off almost. I almost <laughs> look like Aaron every time. You talk. Yeah, see, I've known Aaron a lot longer, so you see what happens, right? <laughs> don't, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> no. I mean, it's impressive. I, I mean, to see, to see land contracts on there, manufactured homes specifically, Last yeah. time around, they didn't have that. They just said mortgages and notes, and, and we were able to get some land contracts in there. But this time, they've really expanded the program, and they're going right to the heart of it. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I, Kevin, you probably know this. I mean, it, do land contracts have a higher rate of default than mortgages? I don't have any stats on that. I, I, there's no way that they can keep stats on that. But in my personal opinion and experience, mm, no. No, I don't. I don't think anybody could make that that equation. If anything, people with land contracts know that technically they could be converted in in, in a very quick period of time into a tenant and evicted. Mm -hmm. So I think people on land contracts have a tendency to try to work more with the borrower because the borrower is already on the title to the property, so it's a much quicker process. Yeah. It's the people who know that there's a judicial foreclosure that you know start to go. Well, I'm just going to ignore them you know, and, and see what happens down the road. Yeah, that's how, that's how I've seen a lot of people converting their land contracts just to first mortgages, especially. So that's awesome. Um, uh, Kevin, were you want to do any Q&A or we need to wrap it up? I think we're pretty I sure. Take a few. I, I have a hard out. I've got a, a I've got an appointment here at four o'clock that I is an absolute must, um, must be. So if okay. there's a couple of questions, I can do that. But if, uh, if not, I can leave and then you guys can take it, uh, take it from there. Did you get any on Facebook, Ben? Anybody on so uh, you know, the social media interwebs? If you want, if you're, for those of you that are on actual Zoom, you can just post anything in the Q&A. Uh, here's one, Kevin. Do, do land contracts, I mean, it, for the motivation of the seller, do you think that that's going to be higher just, be, you know, especially for the ones like Aaron said that maybe not, have not converted, you know, because you talked about the borrower, like they're, they might be fearful. All right. These guys could just like kick me out and be done with me. You know, I don't have much in the way of rights versus, you know, is, is a, are they considered, I guess what they're asking here is, are they a more of a motivated seller than a first position, you know, mortgage note? The, the, the part of the borrower living in the property is that who they're no the the owner of the land contract would they you know if they've got somebody that's delinquent in there do you think that their motivation to sell in your experience is higher than those you know of a first mortgage no shouldn't be I don't know that that question's related to the the topic at hand but there are times you want to convert a land contract there are absolutely times you don't want to 
Because if you have a land contract and let's say the house is worth $100,000 and they owe $40,000 on, on the land contract that you paid $30,000 for, if you converted that to a note and mortgage and now you foreclose, the most you could get at that foreclosure sale is your unpaid balance you know, in a rearage account. So let's say forty grand. versus you know, if you keep it as a land contract and you convert them to a month-to-month -month tenant and then evict them, you get a $100,000 house back. You know, yeah. um, if I have a land contract, am I more motivated to sell it because somebody's delinquent? No, because I can go after the property. Good that's answer. Quicker, if that's what the question was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Paulette asks, is there uh, going to be a course for this? Actually, we're going to be talking about this in depth at the events in Orlando in September. So in case you weren't there at the beginning, that's happening uh, September the 24th through the 25th in Orlando. And we do have a few discounted tickets available. Again, it's uh, the promo code. If you go to noteworthyusa.com forward slash events, the promo code is sponsor one, capital, all caps, sponsor one, and the number one. Uh, there's five of those uh, and you can get 50% off the ticket. And I'm going to be there all two days, everybody. You're going to hear me uh, uh, for full two days. And we're going to use real case studies, live deals, you know, deep dive, uh, essentially show you the methodology of approaching all of these deals the way that I've been doing and teaching it and, and, and have really taught some of the most successful people in the industry on. So highly encourage you. Uh, if you can be there, uh, be there for, for sure. It's going to be well, well worth it. You can come, you can come celebrate my 25th birthday. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Tw was it two, five? <laughs> yeah, I'll be 41. <laughs> That's right. awesome. All right. Well, thanks, I hate to cut you on everybody, but I do have that pending appointment. So I'm going to go and, and you guys can, can stay on and, and, uh, awesome. Uh, Thanks, Kev. Wrap, wrap things up here. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed yeah. that, Ben. Aaron, good to see you guys. Appreciate you. Have a good one, buddy. We'll see you. Cool. Do you want to throw up anything on the screen or share the side? Or uh, yeah, I can. Hang on one second. Yeah, we just do that, and then we'll we'll bid everyone adieu. Sounds good. So we do have a bit big enough space too. So for those of you that will be traveling to the inner circle event, um, you know if you. We encourage you to, you know, take appropriate measures, um, you know, for attending in-person events. You know, you're welcome to wear a mask. We'll, there will be social distancing, you know, in place. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sensitive to that and, you know, have people that in our families that are in healthcare that work in the healthcare industry. And so we totally get in respectful of that. Having said that, though, yeah, you for sure should come out. It's just going to be a small, intimate event. We have a few special guest speakers we've added that will be um, adding some additional uh, bonus material and content. But this is like really a hands-on workshop and inner circle event. You can see all the things that we'll be covering, you know, there, there's, you know, about 20 uh, plus bullet points. And those are the things uh, that we are covering. Um, there isn't really anything else to, to do, you know, from there. Like we don't, we don't have, um, you know, additional things to offer other than subscribe to our newsletter or come to, you know, future uh, events, summits, conventions. Um, if you want to do some like group coaching, uh, mentoring, uh, or I think Kevin calls it group consulting, um, that's, that's part of that, then you can, you're welcome to do that um, as well. But this is the event um, and we're not selling anything else. It's, uh, we're just doing it. We're going to capture the content and you know we'll we'll sell it as additional course material in the future at an even higher higher ticket item. So um, I think that's really about it. Ben, you got anything else? That's it, guys. So uh, hopefully we will see you there again. Sponsor one, all caps, and the number one, the word sponsor, fifty percent off the ticket. There's only five of them. Uh, one of our sponsors was very generous in, in helping us with that. So uh, and we've got I think less than. 20 maybe 16 seats left. Cool. So uh, get your ticket and we will see you there. It's going to be awesome networking. It'd be great to be uh, with everybody again, or as, as many of you as we can. So we'll awesome. see you there. Thanks for All coming. Right. Hey, Thanks. Guys, appreciate it.